Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and welcome back. Welcome back to the Porsche Cool Podcast. My name is Michael Bath, um, and it's hot. It is a very, very hot day. I'm still in London uh, for the next little bit, couple of weeks, maybe. Um, and these are recorded in advance. You know that. So this one's probably this could be almost a month in advance. But it's uh, it's today in London is 31 degrees uh, for our. American listeners, that's about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and the building that I'm in, the apartment building, there is the air conditioning is broken. Uh, well, they're fixing it. It's not broken. It's been broken for a long time. They're, they're fixing it, and they just happen to be fixing it this week. So I am persevering. It's, seven, it's almost 7 p.m. here in London, and it's still 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's hot. It's very, very hot. But apart from that, looking forward to this one. Um, this is Owner Stories number 82. Uh, if you haven't been here before, Owner's Stories is the episode, the only episode of Porsche Cooled at the moment, uh, where I chat to other Porsche owners around the world, normal people like me who have one Porsche. Some people have more than one Porsches. Freddie, a few weeks ago, had quite a few. Um, and that's what it's all about. Um, there was, if you go through the back catalog, if you haven't been to the podcast before and you want to listen to some earlier episodes, there's a lot of episodes. We're up to number, this is episode 189, I think we're up to today. Um, there's a lot of other episodes to listen to, which is uh, Steve and myself uh, chatting about all things Porsche. Steve, my friend in Sydney, who owns a 997 GT3. Um, so they're the other episodes that you will listen to when we used to do two episodes per week, Tuesdays and Fridays. This is Tuesday's episode. All right. So I think I've got everything working today. Like I said, I've been having a few technical difficulties over the last few weeks. So I'm just getting set up here, but everything's in order. Um, and I'm going to be joined very, very shortly um, by Harv. Harv's coming in from Canada. Uh, Harv's a, I think he's a filmmaker, uh, which is pretty exciting. He's got a really cool 911 in a very, very special color. So let me get Harv through Zoom from Canada to talk about his Porsche Cooled owner story. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to Owner Stories. Like I said before, number 82. And now I'm joined by Harv. Harv's coming in from Canada, from Toronto in Canada. Good afternoon, Harv. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Nice to, uh, nice to see you. How are you doing? Good, good. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming on today. I know I cancelled you yesterday, so I apologize for that. I'm, I've been doing that a lot lately. <laughs> my, day job is, my day job is interfering with my life. Um, I so, know what that's all about. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it wasn't, but, you know, it does pay the bills, so that's the main thing. Yeah. So, just so the listeners know, Harv reached out to me through Instagram, which is how you can be on this podcast. If you want to be on Owner Stories, you just reach out through Instagram and send me a DM. Harv, let's, let's, let's just start, let's just start where, I, where I begin all these podcasts. Let's just start about the first memories of Porsche. Um, and the first, what was it for you? When did you start noticing Porsche? Was it... Did you have a poster on the wall? I know I never did, but did you start <laughs> noticing them when you were a kid or did you have friends that owned them? When did it kind of yeah. begin for you? So definitely as a kid, um, I, I, I forget my mom came home. She had, uh, she was working at this, uh, volunteering at some like charity event at this bazaar and she came home with this um, Porsche, uh, like 80s style Porsche print in a gold frame, exactly what you would expect. Uh, a red a guards red 911 targa um and uh you know from some gallery in miami it's set on the bottom or something right. and uh it's still, that that picture still hangs in the garage here now but that that's where it definitely all started for me at about uh i want to say about 12 years old um and that that's when i really really fell in love with the uh that 911 i just knew one day i needed to have one uh, so um it continued sorry go ahead so you grow, you're growing up in Toronto? You're growing up in Toronto? That's yeah. where you were? Yeah. Were there many around at yeah. that time? Did you see many like in your street or on the roads driving around? Um, what? Not, not really. Like I didn't, I definitely, not that I like took notice of when you did see one, it was rare. Um, I, I've been told there were a lot of, you know, obviously just by the volume of them around, there were a lot of 70s. Um, like early seventies models around here, but I, I didn't see a lot of the eighties stuff, uh, especially not at that age. So when, when I saw that, when I saw that poster, it was like kind of my first glimpse in it. And I just, I found love and that poster just was kept forever. It was never going anywhere. It's cool how you still got it. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Cause most people would sort of, you know, 
get rid of those over time. You know, you lose it in the moves or whatever. Yeah. No, I, in fact, now I, I, I bought more of them. Like I found many oh, really? more of those 80s style. I'll, I'll go pull it off the wall after and show it to you. <laughs> I just want to tell the listeners too, you're sitting, you've got a very cool backdrop there with all the boards, all the decks. What's the story behind those before we go into in, further into the cards? Um, yeah, so I'm a collecting, I'm a collector of many different things, but uh, my true like artistic love is vintage skateboard decks. Okay. Um, and, and that's where I find a lot of my creativity from. It's just kind of, I look at these these graphics that, you know, were my childhood and that like, um, you know, motiv- motivated me so hard to do so many things like work hard so I could have skateboards or, you know, like want to be an artist or want to own a skateboard company, which I, I did early on in my life. Okay. Um, you know, that these, this is my generation's uh, Andy Warhol was the, was the artist who made these skateboard graphics. So I have, um, I have a collection of about 200, Wow, two hundred uh, skateboard decks, and this, these are all, you know, nineteen eighty-five to eighty-nine, ninety in this room. So, so these like Bones yeah. Brigade, sort of Bones Brigade, sort of stuff like that. Yeah, th- this is the Schmidt Sticks room, but I have a Bones Brigade yeah. room in the other. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would. I thought you would. Very <laughs> cool. Very cool. All right. So, what about the cars? You, you see the Porsche. Most of us, you know, it doesn't happen. You've got the poster. It doesn't happen for a long time before we sort of realize that dream. Yeah, and, a long, and you, long time. Yeah, and you said to me, you know, off recording, you, you know, there's not that many memorable cars. But what was there something along the way that you kind of think back at now, if you know, that it could be something that you might enjoy again? Is there anything there or any part of it of the cars that you've owned that that sort of moved you towards Porsche? Um, I think it was driving everything but a Porsche. Okay. Uh, you know, like I, I, started, I think my first car was like a was a Jeep YJ which, um, you know, which Jeeps are huge again now, but back then they weren't like, they didn't have the popularity they do. And, uh, you know, it was a fun car, but it was also like an American piece of garbage. Uh, you know, it wasn't a very, it wasn't a very well-made car back then. Um, and from there I went, I spawned off of like American cars into the Japanese cars and I played tuner cars for a while. I had like, you know, Integras and uh, Prelude, like souped up Preludes and RSXs. Um, and then eventually landed in BMW's path, had a bunch of BMWs, um, you know, which was, which was a great, you know, car to like drive, but it didn't, it never really, um, I, I was, I think every time I bought a car and, mm. and most of these cars that I was buying new and leasing and, you know, switching cars every two years, I kind of had that habit. Right. Uh, I, I never really, every time I got in the front seat of a car, I was always like, oh, what am I going to get next? Like day one, minute one, right? It was always mm-hmm. like this really, I know this isn't the car I want. Like this is just, this is a car I like, I'm going to drive it, but it's not what I want. Um, you know, and that all changed the minute I first sat in a, you know, and drove a Porsche. And that's what a 911 does, doesn't it? It makes you realize that, okay, I'm, I'm content in this. You know what I mean? I could get a different 911, but I kind of don't need to look at anything else. And I think you're right. You go through all these cars and they just, there's certain traits with them that, you know, that appealing, but they're not really everything. And when you drive a Porsche, you realize there's so many things that just are so much better than anything else. You know what I mean? So much better. There's something tactile about it, especially the, especially the classics, the air cooled. Um, There's something about being in that car that, should not be as big inside as it is. Yeah. You know, considering how small it is on the outside. Yeah, true, um, true. And then you get into like a, a new 911, which is like huge in comparison. Like you could eat my car and they're smaller inside. Have you driven one yet? Right? It's like you don't have... Have you... This. Sorry. Yes. So you've driven yeah. a 992? Yes. And what did you think? No good? Too big? Oh, amazing. I mean, like the, it's an incredible... I, I have a... Uh, the the I have a brand new or last year it was new a Macan GTS um, that I also picked up. You know, I, I was driving Range Rovers for a while. I they were awful cars. I decided, you know, I'm going all in on this Porsche addiction, uh, and I switched my my Velar for a GTS. And um, you know, th- this is the crazy thing: is that SUV is as fast as a as a 911. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like it's so you drive the 911. It's just it's got definitely more acceleration because you're lower. You know, you can feel the road better. But like in terms of the speed, I find that like 
there's a such thing as too fast. And I feel like the new 911s are so fast to get you to, you know, a hundred that you kind of miss out on the thrill of what you get in a, in a vintage car. There's just something about getting you there that you know it's going to get there, but it's not just like step on the gas. Yeah, I was going to say that. It's 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 the journey to get there, isn't it? It's that thrill of yeah. getting there, of going through the gears and getting there, rowing through the gears and getting there. So when did the so the the nine eleven? When did that start becoming a reality for you? When did you start searching for it and start thinking I'm ready to buy one now? Um, I I guess I've always been looking. Um, I led a very you know, I led a very transient life for a long time as a, as a filmmaker. I was always all over the place. Uh, I was never in like, you know, I'd be here for five months, here for four months, here for three months, there for six months. So I never really like, I was never really concerned about having a car because I wasn't ever home to really drive it for a long period of time, for probably right. like seven, eight years. Um, you know, I was just bouncing all over the place. Um, but every time I would see a Porsche, especially if it was in the brown tones, I was just like in awe. Like I love brown portions. It's just, that's just my, <laughs> I think that era of like where the, you know, you take out a color that wouldn't work on any other car. You put it on a Porsche and you're like, Oh, there's something classy about that. True. It's just way like more um, prestige than like a red sports car, which is just basic. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but so I would say, you're right though. It does work on a, on a Porsche, a brown Ferrari never looks so great. I know no, I did, I did those browns and they were pretty awful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, every time I would see one, I would just be like back in my head, like one day, one day. Uh, I guess it started about probably about four or five years ago. I started looking, a friend of mine had bought a, a 996. Okay. And uh, he had gotten a really good deal with it. They were you know, worth not that much at the time because of all the issues. Yep. And I started thinking about it like, oh, well, you know, what's, what's, you know, I could afford this. I could buy this. This would be, uh, this is probably what I should buy. It's, it'll get me into Porsche. It's like, you know, it's not necessarily the car I wanted from my childhood, but like, it'll get me into the brand. Um, and then after doing all, I have one of those brains where I have to research everything, find everything out before <laughs> I can make a decision. Uh, you know, it's like a OCD, ADHD. I know nightmare. what it's like. I know what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, after doing all the research, I was like, I don't actually like this car. Like I, 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 I was ready to buy one and I looked, took a step back and looked at it and I was like, I'm not in love with this car. Right. So I just kind of like, I kind of dropped it for a bit and I continued on looking, you know, I figured I would get to it at some point when just before COVID hit, I guess, uh, my interest was peaked again. A friend of mine bought a 79 SC. Okay. Um, and I hadn't seen it yet, but he, you know, he was telling me like, you should buy an air cooled. You should, these are the coolest, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, I know I love them, but like, I can't afford, you know, I didn't think I could afford one, um, at the, at that moment. And then COVID happened and all of a sudden I was just like, I'm, you know, I know so many people that are dead you know, my age that are not alive anymore, that didn't yeah. make it, that, you know, yeah. like, and all this shit going on around us. And I'm sure like, I'm, you know, I'm not original for having this thought, but, you know, a friend of mine said to me, you get one life. So like, live it now. Why are you going to wait till you're too old to live it? You know? Yeah. And I was just like, he's right. Like, I'm going to just do what I want now. I'm not, I'm not going to buy a Porsche when I'm too old to get in it. You know, my back's yeah. already bad enough. <laughs> we I, I can't, get, we can't get out of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I tried to get to a GT3 and it took me 10 minutes to get out of the, the bucket. Um, that was off the list. Uh, but yeah, so I, I just started looking and I found, I fell in love, of course, with the first car I saw. Right. It was a, uh, it was a 1979, or no, it was a 1976 911 S. It was okay. in Vancouver on the island. It was... It was a strange one. It was like continental orange with um, this crazy brown interior that was like a custom order from the factory, but was not something they offered. Um, you know, it's not something you saw a lot of. It wasn't a Recaro seat. It was, I can't remember the name of the company, but right. it was a different seat. And it looked really cool. And uh, I was just like, I couldn't get this car out of my head. And I sent, I had like made a deal with the guy, gave him exactly what he wanted. And I sent yeah. him money. And I was like, oh my God, I just bought, I was like in tears. I just bought my first 911. And, uh, and the next morning he sent me my money back and he was like, eh, it's too much hassle to like 
deal with you. There's a guy here in Vancouver really? that wants because I was in Toronto and he sent me my money back. Wow. And I was so mad. So that was a nine, like, that was a nine eleven S though. So yeah, it's a seventy six though. So it wasn't. Okay, I, I ended up with a much better car. Okay. Um, the uh, it was beautiful though. Don't get me wrong, and I love the continental orange color. It's beautiful. So he just um, didn't want to organize the shipping. He didn't want to organize he, the literally. He didn't want to organize the PPI or the shipping. He wanted me to just basically send someone to pick it up. And I, you know, I. As trustworthy as I am of people, I'm not that trustworthy. Yeah, yeah, true. So I was like, forget this. Um, so I, I moved on. I found another one. They were getting harder to find every day, basically, what was going on. Like I said, this was not an original thought. Everyone and their mother was trying to, you know, find their favorite car during COVID. So uh, I found another one. It was uh, also a 76. No, sorry. Yeah, it was a 76, but it was a narrow body. Okay. Um, and uh, it was slate gray. It had a rebuilt engine with carbs and stuff. I drove it. It was nice, but I couldn't get over the fact that it didn't have the flares. Okay. Like just that, that you know, Carrera flare, the SC flare. What's the, um, Harv, what's the, ba- what's the year to avoid in that, that series? There's a year that you should avoid, right? Is that 74? Um, I, I remember people keep talking about this so one that seven, you should. So there's, everyone says. One year, everyone, right? There's uh, one year. Yeah. But everyone gives you a different year. <laughs> it depends who you true, talk true. to, right? The internet's full of people. Don't don't buy that. Don't buy that. Head studs, pull head studs, <laughs> this and that, da, da, da. If you dig deep, like I've done all the deep dive into this stuff, uh, which I'll, I'll explain to you after how far I've gone, but like buy the car you can afford. Yeah. And the one thing you should be concerned about is not the engine because the engine is actually the easiest part to fix is the body. Yes, the body the is the thing that got the mm-hmm. most money. Mm. Um, you know, an engine can be rebuilt and it's not, it's not that expensive. And, and that's kind of, that's one of the best parts of my story is that, you know, um, which I'll get into once we get into finding that car, but, uh, you know, I've learned to do all this stuff myself Okay. that I've never, I'd never changed a tire. Before. All right. So you're looking at 76s, you're looking at mid seventies. So you look at a second one. How was that? So I look at a second one. It was it was nice. It was slate gray, kind of like that classic Steve McQueen look. Nice color. Um, yeah. But I couldn't get over the fact that it didn't have the you know that bigger Carrera flare like the SC had. Right. I right. really want. I really that I love the flared bodies, and that's what I wanted. So I passed on that one. And randomly in the middle of the night on some sale on some like internet site I'd never used before. Cause I pretty much at this point, I, like I said, OCD, ADHD, I know every car for sale in North America, <laughs> right? Like I can, people are like, Oh, there's this one. I'm like, no, no, I've already talked to them. Like I, I just knew every vehicle that was available that at that moment. So this um, is mid, and, this is mid 2020, right? Or beginning of 2020. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and I searching on some site and I find this car and it's a, uh, it's platinum metallic. Right. So it's in the browns, yep. you know, that champagne color and it's at a Porsche dealership and it's in Winnipeg. All right. So I'm like, wow, this, this looks like something. And I showed my friend and he was like, wow, that color is amazing. Like, you know, and the pictures, like the pictures didn't even do it justice. Like they, it just yeah. looked okay, but I started digging deeper into it. So I contacted the dealer and they were asking way too much money for the car. It was basically why they had it. Right. Um, why were they asking so much money? This is where the story gets really cool. So this car was uh, their entry into the Porsche Classic Car Competition the year previous. Oh, okay. So Porsche in, in Canada forces all the dealers to build a car every year. And they yes. go against each other in a competition to see who builds the, rebuilds the best classic car. Um, so this was Winnipeg's, uh, entry and they had dropped about, you know, 60 K 65 K into this car. Yeah. Because I was going to say, it's very odd that you would find a air cooled at a Porsche dealer, right? You don't often see that they're not at Porsche dealers, right? They're just not. In Toronto, you start to see them because like the dealers are like, you know, even, you know, even if they're not for, you know, they have sale prices on them, but you never know. Like FAF, you were mentioning FAF before. FAF has FAF Reserve, which is just full of like cars they never sold. Uh, right, um, right. They've collected. But a lot of the dealers in Toronto have an air cooled in the showroom just to show where it came from. Um, oh, okay, so this car is this car is really well sorted. This car is well sorted. But, but it's expensive. It's expensive. And 
they've been sitting on it for like a year and a half, two years since they built it. Right. Um, and I, I'm not sure on the color. I love it, but I don't know what it looks like in real life. The, the pictures are a little pinky um, on the internet. So I get that. I talk to the, the sales guy and he goes out and he takes some more pictures for me. And I'm like, well, this looks, you know, this looks awesome. The color is better. So I start making a deal with the, with the guy from the dealership. And I basically made him an offer that he didn't accept my first offer. He said, he said it was a little low okay. uh, and he came back a little higher. So I said, well, okay, let me just go and, you know, will you PPI it for me? Will you do this? Da, 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 da. He agreed to do a PPI and they went and they took some more pictures for me, a little bit more investigative. And the pictures came back and there was a bunch of stuff that they had kind of like not shown on the website. So like, here's a picture of the back seat. But if I had just turned it a little bit this way, I would see there's a tear in the left. Oh, you okay. know, like, are there, or there's a crack in the dashboard that they blew out on the, on the, you know, with the light was blowing it out, but you couldn't see. Right. So there, there were a couple of issues. Basically they had done a lot of the outside work. It had new brakes, new tires, new exhaust, new, new suspension, all of this stuff and all real Porsche parts, Porsche parts. But the interior, they kind of didn't mess with. They just kind of left. Okay. But you have the whole list from from the Porsche dealer, from Porsche Classic, right? So yeah. it's a classic set. You have the whole list of everything they've done, Porsche parts, which yeah. is really valuable, right? It's yeah. really valuable. It's amazing. So th- so it's an 83 911 SC, and it's an ROW car that came – it was sold in Germany in 1983. Uh, that's what I know about it at this point. And they send me – I said, do you have any – you know, is there any back data on it? So they sent me the this PDF of, like, all of the – maintenance papers from this car right so and and i thought it was crazy they had all this data going back like you know into the into the late 80s right but i didn't realize that this was just a piece of what they had oh okay so i made a deal uh the they they ppi'd the car one of the cylinders looked bad um and i was like oh well now i've got that so at this point i'm just playing you know i'm playing i know i'm buying this car i'm just playing you know I want the best deal. Okay. I'm like, well, you know, that cylinder, da, da, da. I'll give you this much money, put it on a put it on a thing, get it here. I'll deal with the, I'll deal with fixing the other stuff. Okay. And they said yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. So you've already introduced it partly, but just tell the listeners exactly what it had. Because it's got a really interesting interior too. Um, and I'm gonna tell the listeners your which Instagram? Your 83 Instagram, right? So yeah. if you go to Harv's Instagram at my 83.911 SC. Uh, that's at my 83 numerals dot line 11 SC. Go and check that out while we're talking. You'll see the car on there. Let's just go back over the car again. Exactly what, so it's a rest of the world ROW model. What yeah. is the difference between ROW and the, and the American one? So and, the, and the, the interior, R-O-W. let's talk about the interior. Yeah. So the interior is actually a story that you don't even know. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, so an ROW model was sold rest of the world. Um, so it didn't have a lot of the, um, air quality stuff maybe that like were requirements in the U S at that point. Yeah. Um, so basically they were better tuned engine. So compression, of uh, uh, I think it's nine, three to one, something like that. Um, or 10.3. I, I can't remember the actual compression, but higher compression cylinders, right. pistons, and it's at about 204, 207 horsepower somewhere in there, as opposed to 180 on the American car. So, so a, an actual faster vehicle. Um, and it's got the, a, li- a few styling cues, like not the big wide bumpers, G body bumpers at the back. They're the narrow Euro bumpers. Yeah. Uh, it's got the, um, uh, turn signals on the, the side of the cars and, um, you know, would have been sold originally with only one orange, one orange reflector in the front instead of two, there would have been a, a plastic piece there that right. I've now put back. Right. Um, so that that's kind of the those are the main differences. So it, it's faster. It's a a more it's a nine thirty ten engine. So it's a, just a bit more you know wanted engine than your basic American version. Yeah, they're more desirable, aren't they? Yeah. ROWs are more desirable in the SC for sure. And and I you know even then buying the SC, I kept getting told like, oh, it's not a three point two. Three point twos are bulletproof. Blah 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 blah. There's oh, all those, those, those people were wrong though, weren't they? Because even in they 2020, were. SCs were still a little bit under the radar, weren't they? They were yeah. a little bit under the radar. And, and you know, I mentioned him a lot of the times on the podcast, James from Porsche Platz in Melbourne, who has RSR Classic. 
he was telling me way back when he was on the podcast and other times when I've spoken to him, the SC is the one to get. It's a great car. You know, they're, they're well-priced. And, and, you know, in Australia at the time, I think they were, they were only selling for around 60000 Australian. They're now selling for double that, if not more. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, and you, just, you, bought it the, you got it at the right time. You really do. It, it was the right time. It was, it was the, the right time, the right place, and winter was coming. Winter, yeah. So I was like, you're going to sit on this car because they were still asking too much on, you know, where it was advertised. I was like, you're going to sit on this car for another winter. You know, is that what you want to do? And they were like, no. And I was like, well, here you go. Here's my money. Send it to me. Can I ask you a question though? This is in yeah. Winnipeg, right? So it's Winnipeg yeah. Porsche, right? So what was yeah. the reason then, if they've done all this work to this car, that it still had a problem with the engine? You said there was a cylinder in, in issue. Uh, okay, so th- th- but this is so this was again once once again like you know the the mechanic actually who who worked on this car knew Eric Bolds um, okay. pretty good, and they did a really good job. Um, and I have, I when the car came, it had all the data. Uh, I'll get into that in a minute. But basically what happens is this car had been built and then it got parked. And it had sat there for two years, basically, since the contest. So, you know, what happens is you get carbon buildup. And when you go, like, when you go and you try and do a PPI on these cars that haven't been driven, they generally will show a cylinder, a bad cylinder, because there's carbon buildup in there. If you, you know, you put a, you put a high zinc oil in there and go drive that thing for two hours and it was gone. Now I knew that from my research, but they weren't looking at the the manager of the dealership didn't know that because he's used to selling newer cars. So I was like, listen, there's all these issues. I bought the car. It showed up. Um, so there was actually nothing wrong with the car. I literally went, put VR1 in it, you know, high zinc, 2050, two hour drive. No okay. Issues. Okay. So it's winter. The truck comes to your house. The weather's yeah. not that, well, the weather's probably miserable, right? It's not great no, weather. No, no, it's, was so it? it's, uh, it's November. It's the end of November. So like in okay. the city of Toronto, we don't get a lot of snow. Okay. Um, so um, the car shows up. It's a beautiful day. I have to get like, I have to get another tow truck to come and like get it out of this truck because they just shipped it in like a flatbed truck. Right. Um, uh, inside though, so protected. And they're like pulling this thing out of the out of the truck, and me and my girlfriend are just dying. <laughs> like, we cannot believe how good the condition of this car is. Right. Like this car on the outside is mint. It's all original paint, except for I think the they they had repainted the um, the hood was the only thing that had been repainted. And it's just, it's incredible. Um, so, you know, I'm like, at this point, I'm like dancing in the streets. I'm in heaven. There's people walking by going like, oh, crap, what is, you know, where's this coming from? Yeah. Um, and then, and then the guy. But do you have that moment though, Harv, where you think, is it going to be okay? Is it not going to be okay? And then it comes off and then you start doing that quick once around. Oh, just yeah. Just to make sure. Of course. Because I, I was like shaking. I was so excited, right? Yeah. Um, and I tried to go in and see it, but it was dark and like you couldn't really walk around it. So yeah. anyway, the guy the guy <laughs> pulled it off the truck for me after we figured out how to start it. Uh, <laughs> it has like a, a disabler built in that they, is mandatory in Winnipeg on like cars because insurance is from the government. Oh, okay. They have to have a, a disabler in your car. I didn't know where to put it. So I was like trying everywhere to get the car started. We got it started. He pulled it off the truck. I danced in the street. We were like, out and then he brought me out uh or i got in my garage and then i started like you know he left and i started digging into the car because there was like the car was packed full of stuff that they had sent with me so or sent with the car so there was two boxes like giant rubber made bins full of porsche parts oh, really? so like all of the parts that had come off the car because I guess whoever had it before had changed a few things. Like, you know, there was a normal steering wheel on it before. They had taken that off and replaced it with a brand new Porsche Classic. Um, you know, there was a ton of like, you know, spark plugs and this and that and air filters and, and you know, like all the pieces you would need to basically service this car for the next 10 years were That's in those great. boxes. That's great. Along with all the documentation from this car, dating back to the day it got put on a boat called the Diamond Jupiter and sent over from Germany to California. Wow. So who so, bought the car in the beginning? So I, I, this is the only the only thing I can't tell you is who bought it in Germany. And that's the right. thing I'm desperately trying to get a hold of someone in a dealership in Germany because I'm sure they can get me some of that info. 
Um, the uh, because usually, right? Usually, while you're looking in your in your bookcase, usually they're servicemen or people who are working in Ger- like either armed forces or army or personnel, right? That's exactly, who who that's buy the exactly car? Perfect. They have all the money. I've heard these story. You've heard these stories, yeah. I'm sure too. And they have yeah. all the money, and they bring the car back to the US because it's such a special car. Yeah. So this one was purchased by someone that was in the Navy in Hawaii. Okay. Um, I don't know how he saw the car, but somehow he he bought the car. Um, this this is the book of documents that. Wow. I, I had this binder made, but this is the book it came. It's a nice binder. Um, so the um, you know the car came the literally I have every piece of data on this car from when it shipped on. Uh, it went through customs on November 7th, 1985. 1985. Which is around the time that I get this car in 2000, you know, in, in when I picked it up, it was around November 7th, somewhere in there. So it's an 83, um, right? It's an 83, an but 83. Built, built late 82, correct? Built late 82. Um, so I start doing some, I start doing some digging into um, all of this documentation because I just find it incredible. I mean, I've got like all the, it tells me all the pieces that were swapped when it had to go through the conversion in America to make it right. safe for American roads, which is, you know, half that stuff is so ridiculous, but yep. they did it. Yep. Um, and then I find out that the car goes from there, it gets shipped to Hawaii. So right. that's where the, that's where the first owner had it was in Hawaii. Uh, and it stayed in Hawaii, I believe from 85 till about, I want to say 89, 90, something like that. Okay. Um, and then they, that's the original uh, owner, right? That's the original that's the owner. Second owner. So the that's second the original owner. American owner. Okay. Um, the, uh, the, so he, he bought it from whoever sold it to him in Germany and, and had it shipped over on this boat, the right. Jupiter diamond. Um, <laughs> The uh, literally, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the, the piece of paper from the. This is the yeah, just so the paper. just so the listeners know, you can't see it, but Harv's holding up a folder yeah. which is huge. Um, think of think of the largest folder, and that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, it's like an encyclopedia. So uh, the I couldn't find that person's name at that time, um, but what I did find within these papers was this man Joseph Diller, who was the second owner. So he bought okay. it from this man that brought it into America. Uh, he lived somewhere in the San Fernando Valley in California, a friend of his had a uh, car dealership and I guess the man traded it in for something at this car dealership. And Joseph had just bought a brand new Camaro and he, his friend showed him this and he was like, Oh my God, like I need to have this uh, <laughs> you new Camaro for it. Yeah. And the guy took his new Camaro. Okay. So, um, the reason I, I called Joseph, I sent Joseph an email because I wanted to find out a few things about the car because there were some, you know, there were some things I wasn't sure about. And Joseph was great. He was like, let's chat. So he, he called me back and we talked on the phone for probably an hour. And he told me the greatest story. And this is what led me to this discovery. So um, he was telling me about the car the first time he got it and how immediately after pick it up, picking it up, he went on a blind date. Right. And, uh, and he was like, that car scored me so many points in that blind date. I can't even tell you, it's not, a safe, <laughs> not a safe for work story, but, um, but, uh, you know, he said, and especially the interior, that checkerboard interior. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, the check, it had like this awesome checkerboard interior. At this point, when I get the car, it has a brown leather interior. Oh, really? So I didn't know it was a passion vehicle. Either did the oh. dealer that sold it to me because passion vehicles are generally worth, you know, 5% more easily right. than, than a traditional interior vehicle. And the, um, you know, Pasha was so rare for North America in the 911. We saw yeah. a lot of it in 928s, but we didn't see a lot of 911s in Pasha back in, the, in, in those days, especially, you know, especially in Canada. There's not, there's definitely not many of them. So that was my, that was my, like, that was the starting point of like, well, I need to get this car back to Pasha ASAP. So he sent me photos of the car taken in 1985. Fantastic. Uh, when he, or in 1989, I guess, when he, when he picked it up. Um, and so in the pictures, I could clearly see which Pasha it was, what the mm. rest of the, what was missing from the rest of the interior. It was missing the, uh, it didn't have the tape cassette holder anymore. Um, so I hunted one of those down. Um, it had, 
it had air conditioning, but that it, that had been pulled out of the car. Um, right. And uh, I was just like, holy crap, I can't believe this is my car. And now I have to put it back. So I, you know, I, I did some hunting and I found the right people to, you know, build me, rebuild me the passion interior. And they, they made the seats for me and sent them to me. And I had, I bought another set of seats because the leather seats that were in there were, were pretty new. I didn't okay. want to those. So you um, bought and, so you bought all the seats the fr- the front yeah. and the rear seats and and I'll just tell the listeners the pictures are on um Harb's Instagram that I just told you my 83.911 SC there's a there's a slideshow with those images of the original original interior as well. Um so where do you get the fabric from? You get the original uh, fabric? Yeah, it's the original fabric so it's available. Um there's it's expensive. there's a few it's expensive. It's definitely not cheap. Um, you know, you start with the usuals. You talk to Lakewell. You talk to, you know, all these all these guys in Europe. Um, I actually went with a guy in North Carolina, Sonderworks. Um, okay. They, they do some really nice work, and yeah. he was really honest with me, and uh, you know, and was willing to like send me leathers and like you know make something in the leather, make sure it worked with the Pasha, send it to me before we went ahead with the seats. He was he was great to work with. So. Um, how did you, uh, yeah. sorry, Harb, how did you ensure the, the brown leather matched correctly with, because the door cards are original, right? Your doors are yeah, original. Yeah, the door card's original. So that, that's what I'm saying is he was willing to like build, like to, he basically made me a tool roll with what he thought was the right leather right? Uh, with Pasha and the brown and sent it to me so that I was able to like look at it against everything else in my car. Um, it wasn't the right leather. It was, it was definitely too, uh, it was too cool. It wasn't warm enough for. Right color of my interior um so then we tried it again so he sent me a few more samples we found the right sample um and then and then he built the, the seats it, for me look it's it's a look i'm looking at your picture now on instagram it's a really good match you know what i mean and i don't yeah. know why when i saw this image and i've seen this image already but when i saw the image you know yesterday when i was looking at it it looks to me like the pasha is original you know it looks it doesn't look i don't know why it just doesn't look too new it looks actually mm-hmm. almost worn but it's not worn is it it, it kind of fooled me because i'm looking at it now and it still looks it looks I original i think what happens is that depending on which pasha you go with this one because it's um because it's like not white in brown it's like a beige in the brown yeah the, yeah. the beige feels beige already right uh, i also find that with like there's that like darker brown with that greeny blue pasha um, that looks super aged and really and really holds up well right yeah. out of the gate where like the white and black kind of feels a little new sometimes especially if it's not the original. There's a lot of white ash out there that's not the original material. I mean, you know, white. yeah, but with the, you know, with the platinum metallic, it just looks, it just looks fantastic. It really does. I mean. I couldn't imagine, like, it is, it just screams 1983 to me. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it, it, I'm such an 80s kid, like, that. You know, it's it definitely turned. It went from being my dream car and turned into my ultimate dream car overnight when I found that out. So, what other surprises Um, did you find out from from this guy, from the previous guy? What what else did you find out? Anything else that surprised you? um, He so so he told me the story of the car. So he bought the car. He kept it for a bunch of years, and then um, he met. uh, He decided he was going to sell it, and he met this guy from Winnipeg, who offered him a bunch of money for it, and the guy showed up to pick it up and he had three or four other 911s on a trailer. So this guy was hunting 911 <laughs> from California right. and yeah. bringing them back to Winnipeg to sell. Right. Um, so he sold them the car um, that went back to Winnipeg and another, um, sorry, I found the, the original owner's name was David Sarlus. That was right. the, the military okay. guy. Um, the, uh, then, so uh, I guess he sold this car to another guy in Winnipeg that I also talked to. So I tracked him down um, on the internet. The internet's a wonderful thing, right? How it's, do you track these people? I was going to say, you know, like a great detective. not stalkerish you know, at all, but how do you track not, people it's, down it's and get their details? Stalker, <laughs> I've got all their service records. So oh, their right, service right. records have their names on them. So oh, it's okay. just like, you know, it's as easy as like searching Winnipeg, this guy, right? Like, and so they still I still live at the same place, right? <laughs> They're still in place. Diller still Joe Diller still lived in California. That's how I tracked him down. Right. And then the, the next guy, John, John Prawl, he uh I found him in, in Winnipeg and I sent him I sent them both really nice emails just saying, like, hey, yeah. this is gonna be <laughs> super weird and probably the strangest email you've had all day. But did you once own this car? I bought this car and I'm trying to I just want to talk to you about the car. Uh, and you know what? Everyone was really excited to talk about it because this car brought people 
so much joy. Yeah, but you would be, wouldn't you, Harv? Like, if someone did that to you, I know if they did it to me, like an old, an old 9-11 you had, you'd be interested to tell people about it. You know of what course. I mean? Like, it's, you know. I would, if, it was, if it was my old Civic, I'd be like. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, not that I've never had a Civic, but you know what I mean? <laughs> but, like, the, uh, these guys were just, you know, they wanted to talk. So we talked for, I probably talked to each of them for an hour, and Joe and I have, have kept in touch. And he's he has a standing offer to buy the car if I ever want to sell it. Oh, okay. He, he wants it back. That's not going to happen, um, though, right? It's not going to happen. This, this <laughs> happen. Um, the, uh, so the second guy told me that basically he bought the car. He loved it. He stopped driving it as much as he wanted to. So he sold it to another guy in his office. That guy drove it for a couple of years. Then he sold it to another guy in his, in his office. So like okay. three friends all owned this car in a row. Right. And I guess the third guy is the guy who traded it in at Porsche Winnipeg for, I guess he was buying a Macan or a Cayenne. Or right, something. right. And the the sales manager or the parts manager was like, we found our car for the yeah. Porsche competition. And the mechanics were like, oh, not this car. You don't want this car. Like, there's so much work to be done to this car. So they didn't um, enter that which, car in the competition? That wasn't the one did. that they, they, they did, did enter it? Car. Okay. They did, so they decided, they, the, the guy said, no, we're doing this car. This is, it's in our possession. We're doing this car. So they, they went and did all the work and entered in the competition and it didn't win. I mean, there was, there was other dealerships that outspent them for sure. Probably FAF, FAF probably won or, you know, one of the other dealerships owned by Porsche that would have had a bit more. Yeah. Money so you have the images uh, from that competition when it was entered into the competition? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, I also have a book that was printed for the competition. Really? Wow. So the, the competition happened at the unveiling of the Taycan in a, in a place in Quebec City, or okay. in Quebec, um, okay. at, a, at like a Mount St. Anne, at like a ski resort or something. So it was a big event. Uh, it was all press and it was, you know, a big Porsche event. Uh, and they produced like a, a book for it that you would find in dealerships too, which I also was able to track down. So I've got really good provenance on this vehicle. Um, you know, I, I, I have all the data. You found a great one. The only thing, yeah, I, I got so lucky. And, yeah. and the thing is that I learned that like the difference between lucky and not lucky is, is your ability to maybe learn how to do a few things too. I think people buy into well, these cars and then they, they're scared to touch them. Yeah. So as we know, the values go up. You don't come across as someone that's scared to drive it because the values have gone up. But how was the... Mechanics. How was the engine? Was, you know, since it, you've owned it, has there been anything that's that's come up that you've had to fix, or has everything been pretty good so far? I fixed some things. Um, the first thing that had to be fixed was I needed air conditioning. Right. <laughs> you know. Um, so I uh, I over over the first winter, right. I, I literally in the first year I put you know, like I said I got in November. Yep. I drove it until January. So I literally drove it until it snowed. Yep. Um, and then, uh, I put it in the garage and I decided I was going to install air conditioning. So I bought, um, the classic retrofit electric air conditioning kit and I learned how to be a mechanic. And oh, I just started that. Installing. You fitted that yourself. Yeah. Where does I, that come from? That classic kit? Is it's, that uh, it's from the UK. Oh, it's from the UK. Okay. Yeah. It's amazing. It's like, you know, it's a fully electric kit. You replace the alternator to a 175 amp alternator and you install this electric kit and it doesn't, there's no draw, real draw on your engine. Like the regular kit, which would run off the, you know, the belt and, and draw power from the, the engine as it's turning. Uh, so you have none of that. It's a great, it's, I can't re recommend it enough. Like it's not cheap, but it's, it works fantastic. What's the brand hub? Uh, it's classic retrofit. Classic retrofit. Okay. Have you worked on cars before? Was this never. the first major? So you haven't. This is the first major thing you've done. So I've how? I've never changed the tire. That seems so, like a big, that seems like a big undertaking to me. Anything to do, with, anything to do with electrics? Anything to do with electrics yeah, is I, a bit scary, yeah, I, right? I'm a filmmaker, and I, I know nothing. <laughs> uh, you know, Did you document I, it? Did you have the camera set up? You're a filmmaker. I, have, I didn't do. I didn't document <laughs> Why myself. Not? You should have documented. We're, we're getting to that part of the story. <laughs> later um the first thing i did when i got the car was i took the porsche steering wheel off i put the momo steering wheel back on because yep. it's a prototype i wanted that looks great um, you know there was like uh in this box was like red line metal pedals i put those on like all this stuff was brand new too it had never been on the car 
Um, and so I just kind of like started doing little things. Then I parked the car for the winter and I ordered the air conditioning kit. By this point, I've met three or four or five really good friends in like the air, air cool club community that we have here in Toronto. Right. And we all like, everyone's a real big proponent of like getting everyone else wrenching on their own cars. Right. And so I, we all bought this system and I was the first one to go in and I just was like, what's the worst that can happen that, you know, you, you're so scared of cars now because you open a portion now, where's the engine? Yeah. True. Right. It's under a piece of plastic. How do I get this piece of pl- like, you got to figure out how to get that piece of plastic off, which is the most difficult part for working on a car. Um, you open up an air cooled engine. It's not some bolts. There's no computer, you know? Yeah. Later, like, you know, nine, six, four, nine, nine, three, we start getting into more computer controlled stuff. But in reality, there's like literally nuts and bolts. If you break a bolt, get a new bolt. If you, if you know the tolerance you're, you're supposed to tweak it to and have the right books or YouTube, you're going to be able to figure this out. Yeah, yeah. So I just went at it. I just wasn't, I didn't want to be scared of it. I wanted to be able to own this car forever. And I didn't want to be beholden to like, oh, I need to take it to get an oil change or I need to take it to get a tune up or any of these things. So I just dug in and I started doing it. So you've added a few things, haven't you? So you said you changed the wheel to the, the Momo steering wheel. What yeah. else have you, ch- what else have you added? I've, I've seen I the, you've, the, wheel, the high fi as well. Yeah, I put in I put in the uh, the Blaupunk, uh the reissue of the the uh, SQ forty six that they put out that looks like a tape deck, but it's really a you know Bluetooth modern Bluetooth MP three. I like that one, and it's a lot cheaper there. than the Porsche Classic one, right? Uh, I mean, the Porsche Classic is you know it's it's useless. What what do you like? You have a <laughs> screen the size of your iWatch. To, yeah, no, uh, the screen's too small. That's for sure. Right. So, I mean, you have your phone. My phone's uh, the biggest iPhone. It's like I have a map tool right there if I need it. Yeah. I just needed good music. So I replaced that. They, mm-hmm. There was like a crappy Alpine in there. Like nobody should ever have a CD player in one of these this year cars. Um, so pulled that out, put the Blaupunk in, changed the speakers. That was easy stuff. I put in a subwoofer under the driver's seat. Okay. Easy stuff. Um, and then I put the tape deck, uh, the tape compartments back in. I changed. Oh, um, when, when I bought the car, the only thing the guy told me is that he, he, it, it was a bit grindy from fifth to fourth. Right. That was what the mechanic told me and he couldn't right. sort it. So that was probably the second thing I did was I bought the, uh, Stomsky shift coupler, which is a fantastic product and a J West, um, shift coupler bolt thing. Cause it only has one bolt instead of two. So you don't need two wrenches. Right. And I replaced the shift coupler and got it set up and I had perfect shifting and I've had perfect shifting ever since. Um, Fantastic. You know, and I did. Yeah. So that, that, you know, people think like, Oh my, my transmission's gone. It's, it's grinding going into a gear. And it's like, no, it's like the simplest little, you know, you twist that shift coupler a little bit and you're going to find where it goes properly and it's in the car under four screws. Like it's the easiest thing to do. You just can't be scared of it. Right. And that stuff. What's the knob that you've got on there? Is that from a local company? To uh, I had that. I had that built by a guy on, on Instagram, built by Basil, at built by Basil. Oh, okay. Yeah, he does that. custom knobs built out of skateboards. And originally that's why, you know, everyone was like showing me like, oh, you need to check out this guy. He uses skateboard wood. And, you know, I was like, that's cool. But like for my car, I want to keep it really 80s. And so I asked him if he could do a Pasha checkerboard knob. And he uh, he said, yeah, I think I could do that. So he did one. Um, the uh, And now he sells lots of them because everyone, everyone wants them. But it's pretty cool that, uh, that you know, little extra checkerboard there. So what else are you planning? The wheels look like they're in perfect condition, huh? The yeah, Fuchs the wheels, are... wheels and Fuchs are, are, are brand new. Um, those were put on by Porsche. Um, the, uh, the tires were new. I, I need new tires already pretty much because I've did some i done some driving. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, How's the suspension? That, oh, it's uh, brand new. It's perfect. It's all updated yeah. as well. It's all updated. So it's, and it's all, it's all original, so it drives like a Porsche should. Uh, it's not, um, it's not super cushy. It's like, you know, the, the regular green Bilstein XLs or whatever they call them. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean this, the the cool thing about one of the other things I discovered with this car was that when it was sold, it was sold from the factory with the, um, with the sports kit, which was a dealer installed, it was a dealer installed option that you could only get in Europe, um, that put the 
target or the turbo tail, the T-tray tail and spoiler front spoiler lip on an SC. Right. So this, this came that way from, uh, from the dealer there too, which was cool to find out. Um, you know, I was able to go, I, I think there's this, uh, there's a site called Stut Porsche or Stut. Stut cars. Yeah. 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 Like yeah, yellow stuck cars. Like yeah, yeah. The like yellow one. Like yeah. Yeah. Um, some things are free to read and some things aren't that side. Exactly. So yeah. I paid them to like do the little research on it and they came back with like the list of what was sold in the car. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't have the list of what I was looking for was like the, at the beginning was like color data and, and interior data it didn't have that but it told me that it was sold with the you know the blue tinted glass and the upgraded this and the sport this and the you know sport suspension and the the spoiler kit and you know those those things were interesting to find out yeah it's so, good you got all that information uh, what about the color like, what about the color though how rare is that color so it's quite rare isn't it i mean do you know the numbers that were made in the sc they, they say it's not rare if you if you look on rembo oh, okay um, but I think that has to do a lot with this color was also platinum metallic was very big on the 944 and the 928. Yeah, the 44. So I think yeah. that's where it becomes not rare. But I have yet to see in 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 Ontario here in Canada, I've yet to see another platinum metallic. I've definitely seen its twin in the US um, and I've seen its twin with Pasha in Europe, but I've never I've never seen another platinum metallic with the Pasha in the, in the USA either. Um, so it, uh, it's, it, to me, it's rare, you know, they're, they they, um, that color was also used on the wide stock special edition of those cars. So yeah. there are platinum metallics with the matching platinum metallic foops um, okay. that have this, this God awful interior that's like gray and red and makes no sense. I don't know if you've ever seen that. That's the um, anniversary. Um, what year is that? The end of, what anniversary is that? I want to say five? He's something like that. Um, yeah, I, I have say seen. It's in, I think I have uh, seen those. The color coded. Um, yeah, it's weird. It came in two colors. One of them was just black, and it looked it looked normal. I think it's nineteen eighty. Right, right. And what about the number plate? What about the number plate? Did you have that stored away for when you got your air cooled, or was that just uh, <laughs> after the fact? No. So <laughs> I, I was trying so hard to come up with something smart that no one else had done. Um, and, uh, and I, I, I had that, um, I was listening to, uh, I was, I was listening to some music and obviously, um, you know, lust for life was playing and I was like, Oh my God, lust for life. That's the perfect, that's the perfect play for this car. Like, you know, for many reasons, a, yeah. you know, I love air holes. I will keep this car for life yeah. Two, I have a lust for life. That was the whole reason that like I bought it and three, yeah. like lust for life makes sense too. We need air to live. It's a good part. Um, it's a good plate. I like, I mean, I'm a yeah. big fan of vanity custom plates as we call them in Australia. I'm a big fan of them. I think it's a good one though. Very clever. Yeah. There's a, uh, they're fun to see. There was, there was a, I saw a great one the other day on a GT3 that said no PDK, which I thought was awesome. Yeah. That's quite good actually. Cause there's so many of them over the PDK. <laughs> someone else was talking about, someone else was talking about a plate the other day. I can't remember. It was like my other one is a car is something and it says, the other one or something like that. It was quite funny anyway. I can't remember. Hey, what about, how did you get, um, uh, I'm sure the listeners have seen it. The rare shades thing that was on in Toronto. Um, when was that on the 16th or something? Was that last weekend? I mean, we were recording yeah, this in weekend. advance, but yeah. it was, so it was about the 10th or 11th of June, right? The rare yeah. shades, uh, triple zero magazine, sixth edition. And your car was, was chosen. How did you, how did you get your car chosen for the, for the display? <laughs> Uh, I got really lucky. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you know, the thing with the rare shades, uh, you know, the majority of those cars are um, paint to sample vehicles. Um, that's what, that's really what they're showing are hard to, hard to see really rare color vehicles. Um, and the majority of those cars are newer, you know, 911 GT3s, GT2 RSs, mm. GT4s, stuff like that. So the majority of the cars there were, were newer cars um, and in crazy, you know, Skittles, rainbow colors, which is awesome to see those, you know, colors on the modern day 911s because, you know, they kind of, you know, you can buy a few of them as standard colors, but not the good ones. Um, so, you know, to, to see like some of your favorite colors on a modern car, like a signal yellow or, you know, um, a, uh, you know, a signal orange or, or one of those types of things was really cool. And then there was a couple of air cooled. So there was a, a, uh, a purple berry, 
whatever that that um, purple strawberry purple color is metallic. I can't remember its name. Frozen um, berry. Frozen berry. <laughs> oh, no, no, so sorry. It was cassis. It was cassis metallic. Um, there was a cassis metallic one. Oh, there too. And then oh, yeah. There, Nice. Uh, mil- a million mile 930 that the guy from Toronto the old man just drives it every day oh that was there uh, yeah that, that was there as well oh he's from Toronto um, is he along- yeah he's from Toronto but but Harv that that photo of yours you know the photo with the it almost like that chroma paint whatever that GT2 RS is and your car yeah. you know in front of the Aga Khan Museum you know on your Instagram it's such a great shot to have those shots you know what I mean I got so lucky with my placement in front yeah. of that fountain and right across from that, from the unicorn, that, that GT2, well, two Chroma Flare GT2 RSs were there. I know. Um, I don't we, know what. Uh, was it, uh, did you, did you talk to, was it on your show? Did you talk to that, that, that gentleman with the Chroma Flare? Not with the Maybe Chroma Flare, no. Um, Freddie, Freddie, who is on um, Owner Stories number 78. I didn't speak to the person with the Chroma Flare. No, Freddie has okay. a 964 in Baltic Blue Metallic. Oh, okay. Okay, which no. was, so, I think he showed his car there yeah, as well. Yeah, it was there. That car was there too. Um, no, the, so the, the Chroma Flare GT2 RS is the most expensive option 911 ever. 750 k yes. plus. It took four years to, for them to build the build sheet. Like we're talking, I, I don't know if you've ever tried and customize a Porsche lately online, but like this was so beyond anything you could do. Like the stitching had custom stitching. You know what I mean? Like, like, you know, like leather wrapped leather. Yeah, I've seen that Chroma that, Flare right? before. It was the purple shade. There's another car that, that was always written up about, and it was in a purple Chroma Flare. I know there's that green yeah. one, but there was also a purple one, and it was some ridiculous. Is it like 20000 even more, thirty or $40,000 option for that paint? It's like some 120. ridiculous. 120000 120000 I know. Yeah. But, you know, like as, as an image, as, as a visual, you know, that image of your car, in your, you know, in platinum metallic and the chroma flare in the green, it looks fantastic with the backdrop of the of the museum. It's a great shot, yeah, really a great was, shot. It was incredible. So, you know, to see those two things together, which are so opposite ends of the spectrum. Yes. You know, it's almost, it's it's really cool because they both represent the same thing, but in a way, like you know, mine has more soul to it. Like mine has more. You need a little bit more taste to own something like my car than than a car you can just spend a ton of money and turn it into whatever you want. Um, that That's what I find is a little bit different about the communities. Um, you know, people really, really care about the air cooled in a way that um, they want to hug the cars where the, the GT3 community, um, you know, can be just, you know, you get to some of these meets and it's just, there are people that love Porsches and own GT3s 100%, but there are also people that just own GT3s because they're a lot of money and it's a yeah. status thing. They don't necessarily drive. Look, we, you know, I like the GT2 RS. I like the GT3. I like to look at them, but I don't like to spend a lot of time on them. You know, when I got even events, you know, the last event I went to in Sydney for Duck and Whale magazine, you know, there was quite a lot of GT2s and GT3 RSs and that there. And you sort of see them, but you want to look at the air cooled. You want to look at the transaxles. You want to look at those ones, which you don't see all the time. You know, it seems like you're always seeing a GT3 or a GT3 RS now. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say it gets boring, but it gets very repetitive. Yeah, I mean, that's what that's what was so cool about Rare Shades. It's like it's the same car over and over in different colors, but yeah. you haven't seen the colors in real life. Yeah. But when I find when we do our air cooled meetups, because we have an air cooled club here in Toronto, when we do our air cooled meetups, it draws a completely different crowd, and I think that's what I love about it is it draws the you and I's. It draws yeah. the nostalgic people who like you know grew up in love with these vehicles and maybe will never own one maybe have never owned one or never even close to one but you know they want to come over and talk to you and and the conversations are made that come out of it are amazing and i think the thing with air cooled is is that you forget that so many people who have air cooled have had them for a long time you know what i mean they've they've got into it when it they were worth nothing you know what I mean? And they yeah. got into it for the passion. And now it just happens to be worth, you know, 10 times as much or 20 times as much as when they, you know, when they purchased it. But it's that passion. And I think that's what shines through with the air cool thing, you know. And I know some people have bought in later on and, and spent, you know, a lot of money, um, you know, with 3.2s and stuff like that. But there's a lot of original people there. And I think that's what makes it a little bit different as well. Um, with yeah. the way when you meet those, we had a gentleman who showed up a couple of weeks ago out of nowhere, just like, you know, we're, we, we started out with maybe like, 
I think when my friend Rob started, there was 10 or 15 of us. And now there's probably 50 members in this chat. I don't even know who half the people are. But the uh, the a guy showed up a couple of weeks ago. He was like, you know, in his 70s. And he owned this car, this Cassis Red for 35 years or something. And it was just incredible. <laughs> he was so proud of it and all the work that had been done to it and all this stuff. And I was like, I want to be I, you. Yeah, like, I want to be you 25 years from now. <laughs> and you see someone that's 50, a uh, 70, sorry. In Cassis Red, and you think it's quite brave for a seventy-year-old to be driving Cassis Red, right? But he's had it for so long. Yeah, you know? he's had it for so long. Yeah. It's very cool, and he, and he loves it the exact same amount from the day he first got it. And yeah. that's the that's the part I've ever had with a vehicle. I've always hated my car from day one. Yeah, I couldn't wait to get the next car because maybe yeah. that car was going to be the one that, like, you know, put a little bit of. Because it's not that I didn't love cars all along. I love cars. I love car racing. You know, like all of that stuff. I always have been attracted to you, but I'd never had the car that made me go like, this is it. But like you said, you know, you're traveling a lot for work, you know, you're not settled, you know, it's, you know, for me, I know it was, I was living in the city and, you know, in a city and I didn't really need a car. So I didn't always have a car until later on, you know, so that's, you know, it's always a reason. There's a, there's a, there's a reason there. And sometimes it's just being yeah. sensible, I guess you don't yeah. need it. Hey, what else are you, what else is, what else are you tra- what, wanting to do to your SC? You got any other plans? Uh-huh. Anything you're going to add? Yeah, the the only thing the only thing really left to do is a couple of last piece interior things. Uh, I'm going to redo the carpet this winter. Okay. Um, pull the pull the carpets out, redo that. Um, at that point, I'll probably fix a little bit of, you know, some wiring stuff. But you know, you find you find ghosts in these cars, right? I found things wired into this car that I had no clue what they were. They they weren't working anymore. I had to go online and ask people, like showing them circuit boards, like what could this do? Like on like you know Reddit and getting back like a thousand <laughs> different things. Like well, it could be an alarm, it could be a stereo. Be this, blah, 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 blah. You know, like finally I'm just like screw it. There's no power coming. Flip right. So I have some wiring to clean up because all of these cars are full of like Clifford alarm systems or whatever else was right, right. You know, stereo crap. Yeah. Um, so that's a big one. And then yeah, just just to redo the carpet, I did the. Uh, I had a crack in my dashboard, which was, that's kind of the worst. That's the worst piece of these cars is because to fix a dash crack, A, they don't make the brown dashes anymore. Um, and B, the you have to remove the windshields. But mine's all original glass. So I didn't want to, I would just you know, leave those it. things will break. Yeah, yeah. I just so leave I, the crack. I, I got, a, there's a guy in Vegas who makes this product. It's called Dash Cover or something. Right. Um, it was, it was 120 bucks. It cost me more to ship it to Toronto than it did to buy the piece of plastic. It went right in. You glue it in with silicone. doesn't hurt anything underneath it. No one could tell you it's not the real dash unless you felt it with your hand. So what do you it do? You fill up the crack with it. You fill up the split. No, 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 no. It's like literally a dash, like a full plastic. Oh, it goes over the top. Piece. Yeah, and it just goes right over it. You don't have to take the windshield off. You put some, some oh, really? silicone all over it and you just clamp it in and you would never know you didn't. So it's the same dash. texture, huh? It's the same texture yeah, and everything. Same and color? texture. You, you order it to the color of your car. He you paints it to the color of your car, and uh, it's it's amazing. Like I I can't say enough about this little piece of plastic that costs me nothing. Fantastic. Um, so, so I'm that, sure a lot of people are. I'm sure a lot of people are listening who haven't heard about that who are interested in it actually because so many people have the cracked. Oh dash. my god! Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna remember the name of it by the time we're done here. It's uh yeah the crack dash is like there's nothing you can do about it but the the um this guy's product is just good and it it fits like you need a little you know little cut here a little cut there it's just plastic but like it makes your car look a million times better in an instant. So what about your replacement carpet? Are you going to be really fussy on that? Do you have to get that from where do you get that from? Where do you source that from so it matches um, properly? I'm gonna source that. Uh, I use a a company called Lakewell. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. They're at Europe. Um, they yeah. do really great carpet kits. But there's so many levels. As I'm digging deeper into like this restoration game and and, and you know some other stuff, we'll talk about the. Uh, there's so many levels of like what's right, what is perfect, what, how did it come that yeah. you can go through. There's no you know the, the materials. Everyone knows the material. If they have the right if they have the right patterns, they can cut the carpet for this car. It's how do you want it to look? Yeah, I mean, right? I like so, I like those kits that Carbone do in Poland. You know, Carbone yes. do the, the the luggage front, the luggage kits. I think they look really good. Yeah, and they're not. No, those are period those correct. Are yeah, and they're beautiful. They they look fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I'm probably actually I'm. They're probably going to do a custom one for for the for 
what I'm building right now. Oh, really? So, oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah. What are you building? What do you mean, what are you building? <laughs> so I am... Um, Let's I get on to that. Really, I felt really deep into this Porsche hole. Okay. Um, I decided that, uh, you know, I, I, love what, I love what Singer does um, with their, you know, with what they've been doing in the Porsche community and how they reignited this vibe and now they're working with Porsche and it's gone to such an epic proportion, right? Yep. That like, uh, you know, you, you're never going to be able to buy Singer. Like we'll be dead by then, by the time we could get on the list to get one. Um, also, you know, it's a million dollars plus bring a car, like they're really expensive. Yep. Um, but what I, what I always, every time I, I, you know, what's the difference between a singer and another 911? They both leak the same oil. Like there's no, it, they're Porsches, right? Like there's no, uh, it's, it's not better than anything. Um, but I, I started digging into this and I was like, you know, it's really interesting what they've done, but what, what didn't appeal to me about it was that they, everything, this whole backdate genre of like taking cars from another era that are supposedly the best and then turning them into something from another era because yep. they were the prettiest in design. Yep. Um, and then the interiors get a little bit too plastic for me in some of these, some of the hot rods out there. I just felt like, you know, everyone's trying to future, make these cars look a little bit too future. And I think these cars need to look like they were meant to look. Right. So I decided I was going to build, I was going to build what my version of that should look like. Um, and, uh, so I started a new company, it's called history projects. Um, that you're the first person to ever hear about it. Uh, and each car I'm building is, you know, a little piece of Porsche's history. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm building, I'm building, um, 911 STs, um, okay. on original long hood bodies. So I'm saving classic vehicles. I'm saving classic vehicles from, you know, some of this stuff is garbage. Let's be realistic. There's a lot of rust in a 60s, 70s car. If it hasn't been yes. maintained well or kept in the right place, a lot of this needs to go. Yes. So I'm trying to find cars that aren't perfect, but that have good bones. And I'm building my version of what I think a, you know, a modern day 911 should feel like. So you started uh, buying it, cars? Yeah, so I uh, the first one I bought that we're, we're in production on now is a 1971 911E. Right. Um, Which and, is a great car. Uh, it was a great car. And the car looked beautiful. Um, but when stripped down to just the body, there was, you know, the problems you find on a non-rust-proofed vehicle from the early 70s. But Harv, that's so a big cost, did, though. Uh, when you've got all that rust in there, that's a that's pushing the price off of these cars, right? If you start fixing the rust. These cars aren't going to be cheap. That, that's, the, that's the one thing. But they're also not going to be backdates. Okay. These are authentic 70s 911s um, and, and 60s 911s. So, so for me, there's, there's value in that. So it's worth saving these cars. Um, so I, we started this one. We've, you know, we, we tore it apart. We replaced the pieces of the body that needed to be replaced. It wasn't actually that bad. It's usually like rocker panels. This, this one had a good seat pan and had a good floor. Those are, those are really important pieces there. Right. The, the rest of the stuff's easy to, you know, cut and weld. Um, so I, I, we did that. Um, it's all metal, all steel, ST flares, hand rolled, um, beautiful product out of, out of, uh, out of Montreal, out of Quebec. Um, I've got, um, I've started basically as, as a, as a director and producer in my daily life, you know, the ability to take money and budget it out and figure out how to spend it properly. Um, I really took that idea and I turned it into this business. So I am doing some of the assembly, but I have sourced the best in the Porsche community to do the things that they are best at. So I have a phenomenal engine builder doing my engine. I have a phenomenal body person doing my body and paint. Uh, I'm working um, with, you know, amazing interior people on the interior and it's okay. all my design. It's all my way of speaking Porsche. So but, what is the, let me just interrupt you for a second. So what is the, the listeners are listening going, so what is this, what is the key difference then between a, a 71911E and you're going to, you're going to upgrade it, you're going to, you know, customize it. What is the key, yeah. what are the, what are the key differences? What are the key points? The, you said the flares and what are the key differences of this car? 
But someone so, would, so someone I, who's I, thinking, I just want a basic 911E, but then think, well, I'll come to you and I'll get this 911E done by you. Yeah. So that, that person's not coming to me. This is a different car. I'm building a piece of art. Okay. I'm building art. Okay. Um, that, that person wants to go, you know, buy a 911E because um, he wants it to be a 911E. I, I'm taking these cars and turning them into something a little bit different. Um, the all of the aesthetic is based on Porsche's design. The interior for this car is based on a, on a 68 short wheelbase 911, but Porsche had issues with that interior. It was a beautiful interior. It's probably my favorite interior, but the materials yeah. used yeah. weren't the best. The pockets, the best shape, but it's made out of material and rubber bands. Um, the, the way the door card fits um, yeah, a speaker... It's, mm. it's just not like, like a speaker goes in, it destroys the whole look of the car because mm. it cuts the door card at a place where it shouldn't be cut. I'm, I'm taking these small aesthetics that I love from Porsche and I'm just tuning them a little bit so they work a little bit better with a modern material. Like you're going to get in this car and you're going to think you're in a 71 not a okay, It's fantastic. sparse. There's nothing clean. There's a lot of hidden stuff. It's kind of James Bondish in ways because I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want it to not look like a 911 when you get in. And I feel like some of these, some of these retro mods you get in and you're like, okay, I'm in a Mustang Ford. Like I, this feels so plastic. It's not a 911 anymore. It's not sparse. It's not uh, simplistic. Okay. So the car you're working on now, <clears throat> is that a customer order car? Or is that going to be just the, the car you're going to show off to, to get more to orders? So this is the... the the one, so this is the, uh, the idea behind history projects is that each car is, each car celebrates different pieces of Porsche's history. It's not, mm -hmm. I build the same specific car all the time. Um, we will build, we're going to build this one. Once this one is done, we're going to sell it and we're going to build it up. Okay. Uh, we're not trying to build a hundred cars a year. I'm not trying to compete with Singer. I love Singer. Don't get me wrong. And everything they do, that's a business. This is more this is more art. It's more about someone who wants something that's a one of a kind thing that yep. you know someone else can't have. Bespoke, We're not going to do the bespoke. same thing. To yep. Yeah, very bespoke. And I think there's, I think there's a great, there's a great moment for that industry right now because everyone, everyone's stuff looks exactly the same. Like I, you know, there are so many great Porsche companies, and and please, Renline, don't take this the wrong way. But when you see you see a car that's over Renlined. Yeah, like when it's got too many yeah, red no, no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, exactly. It's like okay, guys, like you. Yeah, I get it. You bought every piece you could because you wanted to customize it to be your car, but it looks exactly like everyone else's car. Um, you know, I'm spending the money to really change what this car looks like inside, so that it looks like a real 911 in the end, but it has some additional usefulness. Okay, sounds good. So, what's the time frame? What sort of time you, does it take um, for, you to complete one car, like the car you're working on now? Probably like, I would say a year, maybe eight months, if, once, we're, once we're out of this nightmare. We, we were supposed to be done in the next little bit, but suspension has, there's no, there's no parts available. This right. is the, uh, you know, the COVID, the COVID madness has not changed yet. No, it hasn't changed. So this is a new business, right? So, you know, yeah. you take precautions. Are you buying more than one car now? You're still buying the cars ready? You're not doing multiple cars at once, though, right? You're just doing the one car, you complete that. No, I'm not doing multiple cars. I, I, have, the, I have the lead on the second body that I'm going to do. Okay. Uh, I know where it is. Okay. Um, you know, and, and I have the thing that, like I was mentioning before, my community, my community is, has become so filled with Porsche lovers. We all help each other. We all, I have people to soundboard my design off. Um, and, and what I'm doing and to help source and, you know, figure out how we do things that weren't doable before. That's, what's really cool about the Porsche community. And when you dig into it, like you don't need to go to the guy that charges you $10,000 to do a custom gauge, right? There's a guy who does them better and he's like just a Porsche lover working out of his house, doing them, find the best person for each piece. That, that guy's the best for this. You want your, you want something Cerakoted, you want to yeah. go to, you know, to this guy, he's the best guy for this, and he loves Porsche. Okay, that so makes sense. you know when yeah. you when you use your community to source the the love that's going into this car, when you when you take people and you go, I don't want, I'm not just hiring you to to do this for me. I want you as a partner in this. Like I want you to be a partner in what I'm trying to do. 
So what about uh, the what about the engine, the engine side of it though? Because I know a lot of the listeners will be going. So what you know, engines really important. Looks are cool, but what about the engine? This is a hot rod engine. This is more power. Who? What's the the history behind the engine side of it? So we sourced the engine out of a '76 Ford Pinto. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) It's a. It's uh the engine is out of a 993. It's a 3.6 liter engine, uh, okay. up to 3.8. Um, it's got a, a 915, a newer 915 geared to 731, so a ton okay. of torque. Um, it's uh, you know, it's not, it's it's using this car is being built to be drivable by someone every day. Okay. So this is one of the mistakes people make is they go and they buy these, you know, crazy hot rods with ITBs and carbs and all this stuff. But if you're not a tuner and if you're not someone who knows how to tune an engine, the chances of you being able to keep that car running properly year to year, it's going to cost you a bunch of money. It's not cheap to tune a car. You know, you, you can put $30,000 worth of, you know, uh, you know, uh, a Motec and, and some ITBs in there and you could still need another 12 to 15 K in tuning just to get it to run. Right? Yeah, so yeah. a lot of people make those mistakes. They buy these cars they can't necessarily take care of or they require a ton of a ton of work to keep on the road through climate change. So if you live in a place where the climate's always the same, you're probably going to be fine. But if you live in a place that gets hot and cold throughout the year at different times, you're going to find yeah, that that yeah. car system or that, you know, is constantly out of flux and needs to be worked with. Now, carbs are an amazing thing they are you know they sound glorious they produce a lot of speed but when they, they work properly you know they're not necessarily controllable you know like an itb is but at the end of the day that 993 ignition system was con- was controlled by an ecu and it can be chipped to you know anything you're you're going to put in it and you put a how, how do you find the 993 engine where have you found that uh, so uh, that came that came from my engine builder. Um, okay. Out of, out of Quebec City, um, he he sourced the case for me. Originally, I was built, actually going to build more of a race engine, like a a, a three point four five liter, a three point five okay. liter off a okay. liter case, uh, which probably would have produced the same the same horsepower at the wheel, which you know would have been and a little bit lighter. But the um, the the, everyone wants, you know, that 3.8 is such a, it's yeah. a really solid. Engine. Yeah, it's, true. It, and, and with the, you know, with the stock, with the stock delivery system, you can drive this car in the rain and the snow and the sleet, wherever you want. Like there's, it's never going to give you any problems. And that's, that's kind of the experience I want to deliver a client. I know a lot of people that have bought really expensive hot rods and then, you know, have to ship it back someplace because the engine's not working and we don't want to, we're not trying to build cars like that. We want to build cars that are going to leave here. You're going to drive the fuck out of them and you're going to love it. So when are you going to have something up that people can go in and look at? Is there going to be a um, website? Is there going to be an Instagram? Yeah, How? so that, all of that stuff is coming. Once again, it would have been, it would have been here sooner had, you know, had parts issues not been um, the the problem yeah. we've been, you know, played yeah. with for the last six months. Well, um, once the war ends. It, it'll come. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not, the thing is like, I'm also not, I'm, I'm in no rush to, you know, I want to be done. I'm hoping to be done for August, September, um, where, you know, we want it to be done around now. So we're not that far off, but I'm also in no rush to show something that's not, that's not the, the finished product because I want your first, I want your first impression to be wow. Okay. So do you have people in mind who you think may be the buyer of this car? Or are you going to hold on to this car for yourself for a bit? Are you just going to get it into the... No, no. Into like... uh, this, car, this, car is being built, this car is being built to sell. I, I'm trying to stop my hoarding um, <laughs> of things. I will leave it to smaller items. So from, like from, 2020, from 2020, from <laughs> 2020, from having the poster on the wall, from to 2020, to looking for your first 911, to finding a really nice platinum metallic, you know, Pasha interior now, as per it was in the original. And now you're building Porsches. You're building so, hot rods. Yeah. You, you know must, what I felt? You must love. wake up some morning and go, how did this happen so quickly? What am I doing? You know what? I wake up every morning thankful that I woke up. And I say <laughs> the same thing that I told you at the beginning. Um, you know, like, you only get one life. Yeah. You only get one life. So, like, sure, I could talk about building a hot rod forever and never do it. Or I could just go do it. And the worst case scenario is that I sell the car for what I've got into it and I don't make any money, but I had 
just an incredible learning experience. That's great. Great That's experience. That's the worst case scenario. Yeah, great experience right. learning along yeah. the way. And you're using all people, you're using all the um the the engine builders and the artisans are all in Canada or coming from Canada, most of the stuff? Uh, no, all, all over the place, all, all over. over. My interior is being done in the US. The carpets and stuff are coming from, from Europe. Um, okay. The, uh, you know, engines being built there in, in Quebec. The body was done in Toronto. It'll get reassembled in final assembly be Toronto. Um, the body is actually being shipped. What about the painting? So that, you found a so, good paint shop? Yeah, Chroma Flare? Yes. So Chroma Flare, um, I'm doing <laughs> Unicorn 2 as the license. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Chroma Flare, no. Uh, the paint is kind of part of the, the thing that makes it special. By um, the, I wanted to make something. So I wanted to make something that's an homage to the history of Porsche that maybe I only I know about because I, you know, like I said, OCD. Uh, and lots of internet, but you know, I found a, I found a style of the ST that I really loved, and I'm just doing something a little different with it, but original Porsche colors. Okay, fantastic. Um, the ST is a really fantastic car. A lot of people don't know about it, but it, you know, there is no real ST, right? An ST was a, a package sold to like yeah. racing teams yeah, that allowed exactly. the um, bigger wheels to be used during that, you know, 70, 71 or 71, 72, I can't remember yep. exactly. Um, you know, allowed you to use a 10 inch wheel, you know, 10 inch fluke on the rear or, or whatever, you know, they were using back then mixing wheels because some wheels weren't even available in the same, in those sizes. Um, you know, oh, it's, a great, it's, it's, it's fascinating. a great project. Great project. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's super fun. And, and the ST flare is the sexiest flare. That's all. I'll, I'll end it there. Uh, you know, a turbo flare is nice. But it is not an ST flare. Yep. And history projects, that's what it's called, right? So people should, the listeners should look history out for projects. that. History that, projects. That's, that's what I feel like I'm doing. It's like a history project. I'm doing, it's good you know, you research your project first, then you start writing, then you, you know, you whittle it down to the pieces. And, and what you're left with at the end is something that speaks to what I feel is like the best pieces of Porsche's history. It's great. I mean, you've got, you know, you've got so much passion, you've got so much enthusiasm. I'm sure it's going to go really well. I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a great idea. It's a really good idea. My, my wife hopes so. Your wife, hopes so. <laughs> all right. We're almost at the end, but let's 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 go to what everyone wants to know. Someone's coming to Toronto. They're coming in their nine eleven, or they're going to hire a nine eleven or a sports car. Where would you take yours? Where do you take your cars out in in your group, and and what roads would you recommend? Um, I, I would definitely like get out of the city as possible because the city, you know, we have like we have our our truck. You know, they say Toronto's like a a mini New York and a mini LA at a baby. Um, but the traffic is like, is like LA had triplets. Oh, really? It's so bad here right now. So get, getting out of the city is super important, but there's so much beautiful countryside. There's so much beautiful cottage country, lakes, swervy roads, highway. My, my favorite road is called, uh, Gray Road 13. It runs from, um, Markdale, Ontario down to Georgian Bay and Collingwood. And, uh, and Thornbury, and it's just, uh, you know, a twisty, turny road that you can have a lot of fun in. But if you want, you know, we have some, we have some tracks, you, you know, take a trip out to most sport, put your car on the track. Like there's, there's tons of stuff to drive, but if you want that real experience, you've got to really get out of the city to, you know, to enjoy it. Cause otherwise it'll just take you too long to get everywhere. What was the first road though, when you got your 911, when you picked it up, when it got delivered and you took it out for that first drive that you thought, man, this is fantastic. Was that that road? <laughs> Uh, no, that was, uh, that was before we bought this place. Um, the, uh, that was, I took it out on the 401. Okay. Uh, 401 is like a, a very straight highway. It's not the most fun to ride. When you get off the 401, you take the 401 off into the country a little bit. Um, actually we went, the first night we got it, we drove three hours. We went to look at a dog for my, my, uh, my lady's father. Right. Um, he was from Vancouver. So we drove like three hours to go look at this dog. We drove three hours back. We stopped off at my friend Dan <laughs> Kelly's house with a 79 SC. And he's like, wow, this is an amazing car. And I, uh, I guess I flicked on, I was just trying to see what switches did because I still had, it was pitch black because it still had original <laughs> Porsche white in it. You yeah, didn't yeah. see anything. Yeah. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, the, we smelled smoke and the cabin was on fire. That was the best first night ever. Oh, really? Um, uh, the blower motor, the front blower motor hadn't been turned on forever. And I guess oh, it's short. Right. It's right. awful burning smell. Uh, like I said, Porsche pictures of the car Porsche burning. And I, 
like, I was like, here's first memories. My car's on fire. <laughs> the guy called me like, they're like an hour or two behind us. He called me at like six o'clock in the morning, my time. So it was like five o'clock. He's like, I just saw your email. Are you okay? He's freaking out. <laughs> like, hey, it's fine. I'm sure it's nothing. It was the, you know, it was a hundred dollar blower motor. It wasn't a big deal that they paid for. They offered to pay for it. Anyway. But, uh, but yeah, that was a pretty fun, that was a pretty fun experience. <laughs> Fantastic. Harv, we're at the end. We're at an hour and a half. Yeah. I think the listeners, have, wow. they've had a good one today. That's for sure. Um, I hope so. I hope before so. we go, though, before we go, though, I always, like to ask, I always like to ask one more thing. Anything else you want to share with the listeners before we go? Um, just, just do it. Don't, like, honestly, you don't let the, just go buy a, the Porsche that you love. Do your due diligence, yes, but like, don't listen to the chatter on the internet. A lot of these people, a, have never like, they're like so old that they their experiences are old too. Like, there's so much has changed in the past 10, 15 years in terms of like the amount of people who can work on these cars, who know these cars, yep. who will tell you, you know, those problems aren't big problems anymore. Just if you want it, just do it. Don't don't wait. Don't take, you know, don't like don't crawl out of a deal because you're like scared of something going on with the engine. It's nuts and bolts. You can fix all of this. I took an engine building course in, in, uh, in Philadelphia last year. Oh, okay. We, we went out there a couple of friends. It was like $350 for, for two day course with this amazing gentleman. He taught us how to take apart and put back together an 911 engine. There's nothing to be scared. Oh, of. It's a great thing to do. Yeah. So, I mean, all of this stuff is out there. If the paint is good and the body, if the body and paint are good, buy the car. You can fix the rest. Sounds good. Good, good advice. Good advice. Harv, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Really appreciate it. Thanks for um, thanks for coming on today. It's been uh, it's been yeah, great. I, I hope I was able to to help someone else. You know, get into get into an on eleven pick up pick up there. Absolutely, but I think you're right. You know, you know. Anything can be fixed. Most things can be fixed. Rust is always the killer, though, right? Rust is always that thing that we worry about. But it, it's okay. the expensive one. That's, that's the expensive the, one. That's yeah. The one you don't wanna yeah. Do Absolutely. Away. All right, Harv. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, everyone. Um, that's Harv coming in from Canada, from Toronto. Harv's a filmmaker. We didn't really get into that side of it, but he is a filmmaker. And he's got a great, great 911. He's got a 1983 911SC, platinum metallic. I'm going to call it rare because it is rare. Um, 1983, I said, rest of the world version, a little bit cooler, more power. And he's also doing his new Porsche project called History Projects. So keep an eye out for that. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening to the Porsche Cool Podcast. Bye for now.